Hi, welcome to another Learn, Grow, Invest video. I'm Jermaine, co-founder of this community. Today, we're going to be talking about one of the most important topics in terms of one of the goals that you should have in terms of investing, and that's generational wealth. And we'll be speaking with David Mullings, who joined us here before, actually for a similar session to give us a framework for building wealth. So now we're going to take it to that next step, and we're going to speak about how to build that you know important thing that i'm sure you know most parents will think about for their children and their children all right so let's go so if this is your first time here i encourage you to subscribe to this channel like this video it really helps us out and please do Follow us on social media, join our Telegram group. We talk about investing on a daily basis and we provide support. If there's anything that you need assistance with, just you know, feel free to reach out to us. So now I have the pleasure to introduce David Mullings. So David Mullings is the chairman and CEO of Blue Maho Capital Partners Inc., a Miami-based private firm focused on wealth creation via investments in public and private companies. He is the recipient of the Distinguished 2021 Foundation of the, Un the University of the West Indies Chancellor's Award for Business Excellence, a member of the Alumni Board of Directors for his alma mater at the University of Miami, Chairman of the Advisory Board of the Development Mark of Jamaica's Mentorship, Innovation and Entrepreneurship Program, Chairman of the Advisory Board of the Young Entrepreneurs Association of Jamaica, an Advisory Board member for both the Latin America and Caribbean Initiative Advisory Board at the University of Miami's Herbert Business School, Caribbean School of Data at the, Mo the Mona School of Business and Management, University of the West Indies and Kingston Creative. David Mullings has positioned himself and his companies to be a catalyst that can revolutionize business, not just in the United States, but also Jamaica, the Caribbean and the African diaspora, along with innovative business practices and approaches, he prioritizes educating people on how to trip how triple bottom line investing works to generate profits while benefiting people and being planet positive. David previously served on the board of directors for the Institute of Caribbean Studies in Washington D.C. was the first future leaders representative for the USA on the Jamaica diaspora advisory board and was part of the planning team for the first Jamaica diaspora future leaders conference in Kingston, Jamaica. David Mullings graduated with his bachelor's of science degree from the University of Miami at the tender age of 19. He then played football with the Real Mona FC in Jamaica, returning to graduate school and completing his MBA from the University of Miami at the age of 22 with concentrations in marketing and international business. He was born in Jamaica and raised between Kingston and Miami. David has been married for 13 years and has three children. Now it is my absolute pleasure to welcome David. David, how are you? I am great, thank you. I need to update that. I've been married for 14 years now, 15 years <laughs> I was gonna say this is my thirteenth year, and I thought that you were, you know, one one year ahead. So that is the twenty twenty one bio. It is twenty twenty two. So I need to update that one that additional year. Yes. Okay. 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 Cool. All right. So I mean, we're just we're just gonna get right into it. Um, we're talking about generational wealth today, and I thought, you know, based on our previous conversation, that you'd be a great person to come and speak to us about this. So. You know, let's start by defining wealth. What does wealth mean for you? No, well, thank you for having me again. Uh, previously, we spoke about you know, investment strategies. Now we're talking about wealth and obviously generational wealth. And obviously, that means family. We're talking about I mean, ensuring your children's children yeah. have, have access to wealth and capital. Yeah. How do we define wealth? I think that ultimately wealth is something that is personally defined. The way I look at it is that wealth simply means that having the means to do the things that you want to do, not the things that you have to do. So if things can be, whether it's donating to charity or buying the material things you want or the vacation or living the lifestyle that you 
you know, feel will be fulfilling. But that's what it is. It allows wealth allows you to live the life that you have visualized for yourself and want to provide for your family. And that is more than just money. Money is a component of wealth, but wealth encompasses more than that. Great. I agree. I agree as well. So since we defined wealth just now, how do we then define generational wealth? So I, I think this is important, and I made sure to double check because you know, my understanding of, of a generation was 25 years. And so based on all the family office conferences I've been going to for the last 13 plus years, you know, the wealthy friends that I know, I am not wealthy. I'm building wealth just like you guys you know, watching this as well. You know, what I think is generational wealth is wealth that lasts four generations or more. And I'm going to specify four generations because... If it's 25 years, that means 100 years from now. 25 years per generation, 100 years from now. And we'll end up talking about why I chose four and not three, not the grandchildren. I don't want to, to bring that up yet. That's going to come out as we have that discussion later. But for me, generational wealth is wealth that lasts at least four generations. Interesting, interesting. So since you define it that way, um, you know, what's, you know, how, how is it accumulated? Like, how, how do you generate wealth? And then how do we get to generational wealth after that? Right. Well, and so I think that, you know, you certainly are doing the right thing with your group, talking about the various ways for wealth creation. Investing is one of them. But uh, unfortunately, I don't think enough of us think about passing on wealth and the smartest ways to do that. So we need to think about, for example, taxes. It is not just simply about how much money you make. It's also about how much you keep and then how much you can pass on. But it's not just also how much you pass on. It's going to be how is the next generation going to manage that wealth. You could be really smart, come up with the, the most creative and legal you know, ways to avoid tax or minimize taxes on your wealth. Uh, leveraging what, what exists, right? There, there are gifts that you're allowed to give a certain amount in the US, for example, is 15,000 US per year that you can give as a gift to a child or another person that's not taxable. So if you maximize your giving uh, every single year, you create the right kind of estate uh, structures and minimize estate taxes. If the next generation doesn't know how to, to build or manage wealth, guess what? Doesn't matter all of what you did if you don't pass it up. So I think that is going to be important. First, you need to you need to grow wealth. You need to learn how to accumulate and grow wealth. The second thing is that you need to pass it on tax efficiently. And then thirdly, most importantly, is that the next generation needs to then manage that wealth. And that's on you to pass that on, especially if you are the first generation creating that wealth. So then based on that, and so we spoke about generational wealth being wealth that will last for generations. So if you create it and the next generation needs to manage it, I'm assuming that they need to add to what you have generated in terms of managing. So that managing is also multiplying in a sense. Well, so it, it's going to depend on how many children they have. That ultimately, the more people you're going to have to divide the same pie by, it means smaller. Yes. So you, you want to really grow the pie. Ideally by the third generation, there should be fairly good machinery working. So the money is now being put to work and generating returns in some way. The assets are working for the family in some way. Depends on what kind of assets you have. And we have to talk about asset allocation. Mm -hmm. But yes, the idea is that in some way, you know, by the third generation, they're not necessarily actively managing. They're actively checking up on the portfolio. But they don't have to necessarily go out and make a new investment. The investments are already there. They're checking up on them, may make some alterations. But yes, you want to create something that's, that's a well-oiled machine and then allow the next generations to then get into that machine and understand how it works. So that's where the knowledge side comes. I think that too many people, especially minorities, I especially find this with minorities more than, you know, especially white Americans that I get to connect with. Minorities tend to want to focus on building one family business and then they want their children to take over that business. I'm going to keep this business in the family for the next 100 years. <laughs> but that's, that's not fair to your children. Right? Your exactly. Children, right, your children. children something else. Right. In most cases, children do not want to follow uh, the parents. They want to do something else. Allow them to live their own lives. But they should understand how wealth 
is created. They should yeah. understand the value of money. And so those are, that's the difference. It's not that you want them to come in the business, but you do want them to at least understand how money is made within the family, the value of that money, and the lessons that came, right? There are universal principles that you can pass on. Uh, if you want them to, to, to keep the business, if you want it to stay within the family, you, you could end up hiring professional management. But you know, so you, you, your children don't necessarily run the business, but they can sit on the board. And of course, it's not the same from a skin in the game standpoint, but nobody can pull the wool over their eyes. So you, they need to be financially literate. No matter what you're doing, your children or if you don't have children, but his nieces, nephews, financial literacy is the number one thing. It's the most important thing that you can do to ensure you get past that third generation mark. And, and I want to, to stick up in on a point that you, you were talking about. If the first generation builds the wealth, typically the second generation is they're seeing it happen. They're seeing the work being put in by the first generation. Yeah. They understand the sweat, right? The blood, sweat, and tears that went into it. They understand the lean times and what sacrifices had to be made. So the second generation then comes in and they understand the value of that work. And so they are going to also build. So first generation builds, second generation scales. But the third generation is pampered. They've never seen the real work that was put in to lay the foundation. So the third generation you know, squanders it, right? First builds, second scales, third squanders. And so traditionally, upwards of 70% of family wealth is lost by the third generation. Wow. And that's a general statistic. Up to 70% is lost by the third generation because that third generation is so far removed from the first. And it, you can actually Google it. It's called shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves. If you Google shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves, you'll see it everywhere. Shirt sleeves to shirt sleeves in three generations. The Chinese have a, a, their own way of saying it, right? Sandals to sandals. It's in every culture. You want to avoid it. And that's why for me, four generations, a hundred years is generational wealth. You can get to three, but getting to four is extremely hard. And it comes down to a few different things that I want to share that, that I've been fortunate to be to be taught about some of these things from families that have gone to four and five generations. Okay, we, we'll definitely get there in a sec, but that 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 that's making me ask a question: What happens to that second generation? Because if from the first to the second, there's this passing on, there's this teaching of financial literacy. It if if it goes. Um, by the third, it means that the second is not passing on to the third what the first passed on to them. Exactly. And, and that's what it comes down to. So, so, so we'll get in there. The, the, the way I was taught, a good friend of mine, Lonnie Geigner, Lonnie, the CEO of uh, the Wilkinson Group of Companies, uh, Wilkinson Family Office, uh, two and a half billion US dollars in real estate deals over the last 30 years. And Lonnie has put together this amazing family legacy workbook. And I was at a conference you know, where the family office event in West Palm Beach a few years ago. And he was saying that he's, he's on stage talking about you know, what's important to grow in your business. And he says you need to have mission, vision, and values and have alignment with all your staff. You have to have these annual meetings, quarterly, one-on-ones, you have these checkups. And so this guy puts up his hand and says, oh, what's your question? And he says, Mr. Geigner, you know, do you do that with your family as well? And he said, oh, no, no, the, the family knows how to do that. The family already knows that. And this is after Lonnie says that, you know, one guy said, well, I don't need to do that with my employees. They already know all that stuff. He's like, no, you still need to do it. Well, he doesn't do it with his family. And the guy says, what that tells me is that the success of your business is more important than the success of your family. And Lonnie said that completely changed his approach to his family after that. So he first started by saying, we meet as a family, we need to come up with mission, vision, and value. What is the mission of our family? What are the values of our family? What is the vision for this family in 100 years? Right, 100 years from now, what do we want our family to be known for? And then instead of forcing the next generation to adopt their family mission statement, the next generation gets to put together their own mission statement. They become teenagers, they get to now feel part of it. And then the third generation then gets to adjust and adjust that mission. But that creates a North Star and a compass. So you can know Here's the pathway we're following because here's what we want to accomplish as we create wealth. And then you add the lessons part, financial literacy, and what age do you start? And we'll get into my stories, my examples. And of course, it really comes from Nelson Rockefeller and, and what he's done. And as a close friend of mine that was a CIO of the Rockefeller family, she speaks at 
tons of family conferences and she always tells the story about the Rockefeller family and the lessons that started with Nelson Rockefeller and then John D. Rockefeller onwards. Nice. All right. So, I mean, this is the part I think most persons are waiting for. You know, how do you generate wealth in the first place, right? So those of us watching, we're trying to get to that place. You said you're trying to get to that place as well. Yeah. What is that framework for building wealth? Right. And, and so we, we've, we've covered this before. I, I choose a framework based on what Michael Leach is my coach. And Mike says I shouldn't mm -hmm. call him his, my mentor anymore. Uh, the framework he has laid out. And it comes down to one, you know, find the role model. Two, get the recipe. Uh, three, don't change the recipe. You can only change the recipe if you exceed the role model. And so you have to pick role models. So if your role model created their wealth in real estate, then you're going to end up studying real estate. Having done an MBA, case studies are really important. So understanding how families protect wealth as well. Wealth creation is important and then wealth preservation. So you need to create yes. first. So get the role model. So if, if in my case, you know, my created businesses and then focus in ultimately as being an investor, asset manager. So investing in public and private companies. So I'm staying on that pathway. His role model is Warren Buffett. So I've made sure to go and study Warren Buffett and similar types of investors. So you pick your role model and not too many, and then you want to learn that and then follow that. So there's no wrong or right way to create wealth. So be very careful when somebody says, oh, that's stupid, you shouldn't follow that person. Here's my guy over here or my lady over here. Well, that may work for them. Right, it comes down to what do I want to accomplish and then what timeline am I aiming for and what's my risk tolerance? We are not all the same. Some people have no problem putting capital as an angel investor into early stage startups. They're going to invest in 15 companies over five years. Ten are going to fail. Three are going to break even and then two end up being you know, Facebook and Amazon. Great. Most people can't survive that. They're going to have a heart attack every time one of the companies go to zero. It's the same way that some people don't want to buy growth stock. Right? You might have bought Facebook in the IPO, and within the first year, you saw it go below the IPO price, and you're freaking out. If you had held, though, for the time, you could see where you, you would have been today. Yeah. It really comes down to what you feel comfortable doing, and you need to get used to that. Risk tolerance matters, and sitting down and talking to a financial advisor can help. Right? They can explain the risk associated with the potential rewards. But ultimately, every investment has the potential of going to zero. You literally, as, as much as we could say, bonds are safe. Well, depends on which country's bonds you bought. You could lose 30%, 50%, you never know. So that's the first thing, role model, recipe, and then follow. Don't change the recipe, yeah. Don't, don't change the recipe. You can sprinkle some sauce, right? You can. And times are different. You cannot copy Warren Buffett's plan from the 70s into today. Even Warren Buffett doesn't copy Warren Buffett of the 1960s or 1970s, right? He owns Apple today. Now, he has his reason. Don't look at that. You're copying it. Look for the general principles uh, when you go in. For me, it's something that I have to remind myself constantly. And I think a lot of us, especially if we don't come from wealth, we want to swing for the fences. So Charlie Munger and Warren Buffett will bring up the fact that you know, it's more important to minimize your losses than to keep swinging for the fences. So you can wait for things that you feel more certain about rather than taking these big swings and keep trying to hit the home run. Just hit those singles, hit the short ones and, and protect your capital, right? Preserving capital is actually important because if you get into something, looks like it's doing good, you double your money, something happens, and you're back to, in your opinion, you feel that you're back to zero, you've yeah. lost everything, you're back to just a principal, but it's two years later, well, there's time value of money. Right? You, there's an opportunity cost. You could have made some other money somewhere else. So you're not really back at square one. You're below square one. It needs to have an even better return just to get back to, to even. And that's something I don't think the human brain is program to understand compound interest it just it, it feels like we should but we genuinely do understand compound interest our brains are just seems to be simple interest focused and so you have to train yourself to understand the power of compounding and why you need to leave something there and let it grow yeah right i agree i agree yeah. all right so you gave us a framework for wealth 
is there now a framework for generational wealth? So, uh, so I would think there is a framework for generational wealth. And I think it, it starts with financial literacy, right? And so, so Nelson Rockefeller talks about his father, uh, John D. Rockefeller, uh, saying that they started giving them an allowance. But he had a very simple rule. I would adjust the numbers, but it was an 80-10-10 rule. So if I give you this allowance money, 80% of it can be spent however you want. You have to track how you spend it, but you can spend it on whatever you want. 10% has to be saved or invested, and then 10% has to be donated to charity. One cash though. For every additional dollar that you donate to charity or invest slash save, he matches them dollar for dollar. So I remember I started with my oldest son, Luke, at, at five and a half. He lost his first tooth, and we took his tooth fairy money, and we bought, uh, we actually bought Berkshire Hathaway. And, and in the app we are using, it was called Roll with Buffett. So Luke says, I roll with Buffett. He was telling his grandmother, she asked him in the car, Luke, you lost your first tooth. Yes, and you got you know, tooth fairy money. What did you buy with it? Did you buy a new Lego? No, grandma, I didn't buy anything. Oh, it's like, what did you do? I roll with Buffett. I invested it, grandma. I invested it. And I remember I said, tell her why you invested it. If you put it in a savings account, how much would you get, Luke? And at five and a half years old, he shouted, oh, less than 1% a year, daddy, less than 1%. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then he asked me to pull out the portfolio and show grandma, you know, how much he's up. And so at that point, he was up 14.4% on his Berkshire stock. So he's rejoicing. Like, coming from that now, I don't know an allowance. We would have him help me shoot videos. That's what we did with our two oldest sons, Luke and Liam. They would help with the lighting, help daddy with the mic and so on. They get to be a part of what I'm doing. And I would pay them. I would pay them per video. So we did five videos every remember one day. So I told each of them, you're going to get $150 each, $30 per video. What do you want to do with the money? Do you want to buy some Lego? Remember, some of it has to be invested. And Luke proudly says, oh, I'm not buying anything, daddy. I'm investing all of it right now. Nice. So, of course, I'm proud of him. But I asked him, I was like, oh, wow, why, why are you investing all the money? And he said, because you have to match me dollar for dollar for everything uh, outside. <laughs> so, so he's actually doubling his money right there. He's doubling the money. And I was just like, oh, wow, I really thought that well. I mean, he got it. He got it. And, of course, he tells Liam, you should do the same as me. So we now check up on their portfolio on a quarterly basis, and they get to choose it. So, so financial literacy is important. It's easier nowadays. It might not even be real money. It might, it might be that it's of a dummy account online mm -hmm. and they get to see. But I think that is important. But you can only teach what you know. So you have to go and learn it first, then start passing it on. But the kids, will they will catch it very quickly. I mean, a simple example is that, you know, the other day when Roblox was going public, Luke and Liam came home from school and like, hey, daddy, daddy, we need to buy Roblox in the IPO. I was like, okay, I mean, I actually know Roblox. But I said, well, here's how it works. You need to do homework and come back to me and present. First question, what is Roblox? Like, what is this company? What do they do? Number two, how does this company make money? And then number three, you need to convince daddy. Why should daddy buy this stock? That's their homework. You now have homework. And we as parents need to get into that when we're trying to get this financial literacy going with our children. And so Luke comes back, Luke and Liam come back and present and say, here's what Roblox does. They create you know, video games and these worlds where other people can create their games. And he's like, well, it's like Minecraft, but I can create more Minecrafts in. That's one. Number two, how does a company make money? Well, daddy, you buy virtual goods in your games in Halo and Destiny and FIFA. Well, they have Robux that they sell and you can use it to buy in-game things, right? Clothes or so on. And so that's what they do. They sell Robux. Okay. And why should I buy it? It's like, well, all the kids at school my age are talking about it. They're always harassing their parents to buy Robux. And I think that as Roblox scales and goes around the world, there will be more children harassing their parents to buy Robux. So we should buy it now while it's growing. And how do you argue with that kind of thinking? And this is a mm -hmm. nine-year-old at time doing that. We need to give more credit. To, to our children, our nieces and nephews, and, and feed that, and feed that, and allow them to, to actually experiment and, and test it. That's, that's such a basic thing that you said, but I, I think it's so powerful because, I mean, we, we, we talk about investments here on this channel, and one of the first things we do when we 
review a company's talk about what the company does. Yeah. And that's because it's very important if you're going to spend money to own shares in a company, you need to know what they do, how they make money. And it's something that I've seen persons say they have a company in their portfolio, but they don't know how the company makes so money. Wait, wait, wait. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and for me, that's that's a, a no-no. I need to understand the business if I'm going to own a piece of the business, a share is a piece of the business. So I think that's that's important. Obviously, I come from the world of investing mainly in public and private companies. So I'm an equities guy, not a real estate guy. I do want my kids to get more exposure, though. So we need them to understand the other ways of wealth creation. So, so eventually, we're going to introduce them to other people who are experts there and then say, hey, you're going to go and see the property and understand what goes into this and what is rent, right? We play Monopoly a lot because I wanted them to understand the value of owning something, building it, improving value, collecting rent. So we play a lot of Monopoly in my house, mainly Luke, Liam, and myself. And in fact, we have four different versions of Monopoly, right? We have the classic version of Monopoly. We have the version with the card. We have a Zelda version, and we have a Mario Brothers version. So we, we pick one and we rotate. But And they definitely, they always want to play the Zelda or the Mario version. They, they don't want to play the regular version. This is what find ways to get them to be entertained while also learning, right? Mm -hmm. Entertainment is, is, is what I've been hearing it called. But I think that's important, right? That's one way to start getting them to think about real estate and the importance of owning assets. We haven't reached a point of talking about estate planning and, and taxes. So I mean, they pay taxes in, in Monopoly. So they've learned that at least. But we haven't gotten to the point of when somebody dies, what happens? We, we need to wait for that topic a little bit later in life. But again, mission, vision, values. You know, we talk with the kids about if, if you had more money, what would you want to do? Who would you want to help? Is there any charity you know of? Or what kind of a charity would you donate money to? Oh, I want to donate money to a charity that gives you know, Christmas presents to children who don't have it, right? They, they have ideas of things that they would love to be able to give to a volunteer. They say, okay, well, if you want to be able to give money to that, you need to be able to make the money. So when you make there it, you now you know what to do, right? The money in and of itself is, is not a thing to focus on. I don't think most people really care about accumulating money. The money is a utility. They can do something with it. They can buy a home for their parents or they can donate to a charity. They can set up a scholarship, an endowment fund. You can support the people you want to support. That is, you need something that drives you to then want to create that wealth and build that, you know, that, that yeah that cash balance in the sense or whatever it is that you're building that asset base way to support but have have goals money supports the goals right the goal is not money the goal is to use the money to do well to do good yeah agreed so pretty much what you're saying is that once we've once we follow the framework to to generate wealth then the key to really transferring that wealth to make it generational starts with financial literacy. We spoke about earlier ensuring that that second and third generation is doing the same transfer of, of financial literacy. And that they value money. They yeah. value money. Okay. Right? There, there's a lot of generations who don't value money, second or third in particular. They're so far removed from it. Oh, thousand dollar ten thousand dollars they don't understand the value of that money and what it does for other people so uh, one of my good friends you know he, I, won't, I won't use his name but his he's a fourth generation of his family big family in, in the shoe business and what he would always speak about at his the family office conferences when he, they would always have him on a panel to talk about generational wealth because their family he was literally the fourth generation and what he said is that when they turn 13 their parents would take them to one of the factories, one of the shoe factories in a developing country. So this is, you know, Vietnam or somewhere and have them see what these other kids go through. And he never forgot when he visited a country in, in Southeast Asia and there was a child that, that had an amputated leg and they were using, you know, there, there was a, obviously a prosthetic. And so the, the father and the mother explained to them that, you know, that prosthetic cost 250 US dollars for that child. And so while you are thinking about spending a thousand dollars on this t-shirt or these speakers, it could buy four prosthetics for children in this 
country. Yeah. And so you're privileged. And so and they are every child as they turn 13 years old, they took them on a trip, they spent a month in that other country because they want them to understand one, your privilege, two, money can go much further for other people. Here's how it can help other people's lives. So he grew up understanding that, you know, I could buy a thousand dollar shirt or I could do a thousand dollars towards charity, but he understand understood the value of the thousand dollars. It's not just arbitrary. If you only grow up seeing people you know, rocking thousand dollar shirts and ten thousand dollar watches, you think that is normal. They're all driving Mercedes Benz to the school. You you're going to think that's normal and you don't have the same appreciation for what money can do for other people. So I think exposing your children to other places. In my case, my dad is a medical doctor and a retired mom is a nurse. And you know, through church, we consistently volunteered at you know children's homes in Jamaica, so National Children's Home in Kingston, St. Monica's Children's Home out in Clarendon. And then we also went up to Mona Rehab on a regular basis, right? Mona Rehab is, is pretty much attached to you. And so we got to see what other children had to be going through and, and some of the hardships there. And so we could appreciate one, how fortunate we were. I had no control over the parents I was born to. I had no control over the country that I was born and I had no control over the year that I was born. That's entirely up to somebody, not me. That had nothing to do with me. So I was lucky. I was fortunate. Once I recognized that, it made me look at resources differently. It's okay, well, if I have more resources and I need, I want to take some and help somebody who was less fortunate than me, less lucky. They didn't pick their parents. That's not their fault that they, they were born and ended up in a wheelchair and had to be at, at Mona Rehab. Yeah, so how can I help them? So I think that was important for my family to that. It kept me grounded. And we need to make sure that even when we create that wealth, and we might have the nice house and the nice cars, still keep our children grounded and then have them keep their children grounded. Right? We talk about those spoiled children. I don't know if I wanted to use it that way, but keep them grounded. That's the important thing. Allow yeah. them to be grounded. I, I think that you said it right, because understanding the value of money, it means that you use it intentionally. You know, it's not about not being able to enjoy what you've worked for, but understanding right. that the amount that you may take for granted can do more for others. And at the same time, you're, you're using it purposefully throughout life. So like that that. It's, it's not being wasted, right? right. So like Purposefully, right? I, I think we also need to be very careful. There are a lot of people who claim they want to create wealth, but then they actually have this negative idea about wealth. They think wealthy people are mean and stingy. And that if you have that much money, you should be donating and paying for housing and homeless and so on. You, you have to disabuse yourself of it, right? It's your money. You have worked for it. It doesn't mean that you're mean or stingy or evil. You have done something that's created value. You get to choose what you want to do with that money. So don't, don't complain that somebody didn't donate or didn't just, that's not, it's not yours. They don't owe it to anybody. We would like them to take some of it though. And I mean, if somebody wants to buy a $50 million boat or $100 million, like, so what? What else are they doing though? Are they giving back? And if you see them giving back, applaud them and say, well, that is an example I want to follow. I would like to enjoy life, but also give back. I think that's the yeah, best. There is, yeah, there's definitely that balance with, with, with generosity because that's the thing we don't oft, we're, we're not able to see how someone spends all their money. So there is this assumption, and you said it around the wealthy, that there is something wrong with wealth in general, and that those who are wealthy, I, either they didn't work for it or they're not doing the, the right things to attain it. Like there's this, this thing around it that it starts with our mindset. It starts with maybe how, how we were raised and taught about money. And those are things that can keep us trapped in this cycle of, of poverty. Because sometimes you have money, but you can have a poverty mindset. Exactly. So you're so minding it to keep you poor. Yeah. yeah. And then the mindset should end up changing once you have that role model, right? Find a role model, get the recipe, don't change the recipe. That should help to elevate your mindset. So now you have a positive mindset around wealth creation and around money and, and assets. And then that positive mindset gets passed on to the rest of your family, the second generation and the third generation. You'd expect it 
to pass out, right? It's just like if somebody sees you drinking alcohol and then you end up going bankrupt and go to jail, the children are going to con- going to assume and, and in their head, alcohol equal bad or drugs equal yeah. negative, right? And and so and then that continues. So whatever it is that happens, people end up associating even that may not have been what caused it, right? The person could be drinking because they went bankrupt, right? And, and so now they turn to the bottle. The bottle didn't cause it. So, but then they affiliate, associate those two things, and and immediately yeah. say, I will never touch alcohol for the rest of my life because it caused this to happen. And it's, so it's the same way with with money. And we need to be very careful about the mindset that we bring, the way we talk about wealthy people around our families and around our children. Right? I have had people that I've had to just say, you know what? Why are you talking about the person that way, or why are you talking about rich people that way? I can't keep having hanging out with you because you're poisoning my mindset. You're making it sound like it's a bad thing for me to want to go and, and create wealth, knowing what I'm going to do with it. Oh no, but you're different. No, no, we're all different. Why, why are you singling me out? You don't know them, you know me. So I think that is that is crucial. So, yes, the financial literacy part is critical to passing on you know, wealth. Now, we need to be also careful about how we think about inherited wealth, right? Warren Buffett is different from many of us. He doesn't want his children to inherit that much money, just enough, but not crazy amounts of money. Other families are different. And so you get to decide your own, right? You raise your children, and based on the way you raise them, you can decide how they are going to manage wealth. Do they inherit the whole pie? Do they only inherit one-tenth of it? And it's based on how much you have as well. Yeah. But yeah, don't think that that is something that's universal. It's entirely dependent on how you raise your children. And don't assume that they are all equal. They're, they're not all equal. They don't all have the same aptitude. They don't have all the same attitude towards money. So it's not that, oh, I have three children, so it's one third, one third, one third. In most cases, uh, certainly back in the medieval days, and, and a lot of those families still have money in Europe. And they, they had one, not necessarily the oldest, but one was selected to help manage the family wealth. The rest sat on like the family council and get their draw and know what's happening. But one person became the head of the family and not always the firstborn. And so there's nothing wrong with having one of them just have more of an aptitude to it or, or studied harder or paid more attention. And so they end up taking over in the second generation and then they trade the next one. I think just like our companies have a CEO, they end up having a CEO of the family as well. Somebody end up de facto just enjoying it and just gravitate into it. And the rest just say, okay, I will learn some more, but you run it, we vote, and we go from there. And I think that's that's a, an important piece, and that's something Lonnie pointed out to me as well. And the family offices talk a lot about this, especially right now where uh, there's, there's about to be a ton, I mean, trillions of dollars flowing from yeah, baby boomers to, to millennials at this point. This is going to be the largest wealth transfer in history and the largest transfer to, to women. 50% will be transferred to females as well. And so what you're saying is that you need to involve millennials more. Actually, you should have been involving them more in family decisions. So you have the family meeting, the business, have them understand the estates, the trust, and get to see more of what's happening and then allow them to even make some decisions. It might not be that they're making investment decisions, it might be philanthropic decisions that they get to bring a charity to the table, explain to the, the family council why you want to donate money to this, and then the family gets to write a check to this thing. But you have to get them more involved, right? It cannot be top-down autocratic. It's not completely democratic, but it can't just be do as I say, and we don't yeah. listen. You have to give them a bit of a voice, and that way, though, they get to sit in and learn. They see how you are interacting, right? I... I was fortunate to have parents, you know, they work between the U.S. and Jamaica. And I never forget sitting in some meetings with some of their financial advisors. I'm 10 years old. But I'm sitting in a meeting with somebody in Miami or in Jamaica onwards and getting to hear the discussions they were having. I don't remember the numbers, but I just remember that I was in the room when I heard somebody talking about taxes and estate planning and life insurance and so on. And then how the portfolio was doing or if we should be selling involve them. Don't think that because they're 8 or 10, they're, they're going to come in the room and make noise. You, you'd be surprised enough. But having them be around those things, again, is going to set that important example for them to follow because they will then do it with their children. And that minimizes the, the losing the money in that third generation because there's no guarantee 
that you will be around to train the third generation. Yeah. Yeah. We like to we're invincible, but yes. Yeah. That's something that I think about a lot, actually. And as uh, my, my, my wife and I, we speak about it because we are of the understanding that there are plans that we have for the future, plans that we make for our parents, plans that we make for our families, etc. But we're very mindful of the fact that we, will, we may not be here as long as we plan to be. Right. And so there are things that we need to put in place to ensure that those things are taken care of. So um, that's one of the things we will talk about a little at the end. I'll, I'll, I'll just ask you to explain estate planning and so on, but we'll do that a little later on. No, I wanted to ask you about, so we spoke about investing in you know, private and public companies. We spoke a little bit about real estate. Are there any other parts that you could open our minds to in terms of generating wealth? Well, well so, so I want to be careful about generating and then preserving, right? We, generating wealth is, is also investing in yourself. Right? We, we, we don't think about that well enough, but we can increase our income as well. So whether it's side hustles that we always like to talk about or improving our existing career, so you go back to school, right? You might not just have a bachelor's, you go back and get a master's, you get a doctorate, you get some sort of professional certification, or you can make yourself worth even more in this job market or changing careers, changing jobs, that, that is a true option. Right? So I think not enough people think about that from a wealth creation standpoint. So, so put that on the table as an option for wealth creation. Obviously, uh, another opportunity that, that we, we don't necessarily think about is, is actually is, is life insurance. Life insurance can actually create wealth for the family. You may end up not being alive, but the insurance can change what happens within your family. And so I think life insurance is really important. You should get it on your child by the time they're 15, for example, get their policies. I remember when my parents you know, said, hey, so here are the policies that we've had for you. And then we're handing over this one to you and you need to, you need to pay that. So you are now making that one to payment. So while I'm working, I know of a policy that's been around. And then at certain points in life, certain ages, and then you know, you're married, you have a child, you can increase the policy as well. But I think that's important because it creates a cash value. Your life insurance policy is being invested. It's not just money you're throwing away. A lot of us feel like it's car insurance. Car insurance is paid out of the money. That's not being invested anyway. It, it literally is true insurance in the sense of if something happens, it's supposed to cover the car and the damage and so on. Life insurance that money is being invested, whether it's a whole life policy or a term life policy, it creates a cash value. And God forbid something happens to you or the wife or the child, it can create an overall windfall that goes into the family to go on to something as well. So be very careful about that. And of course, you can borrow against that, that cash value yeah. at some point at, at usually single digit interest rates. So you may have an opportunity to invest in a, a property, for example, that you think is going to get you 12% a year based on the, the rent that it's going to get. You borrow from your life insurance policy at 8% and use that as a down payment on the property instead of your cash. And you, you buy the property and now it's generating 12, but you only paid 8, 4% difference. And that was never money in your pocket. That was, you paid that over years. So think about how life insurance can also contribute you know, to directly by end up, you know, using a cash value or in the event of unfortunately losing one of you or, you know, a, a child, but there's no guarantee you will be around. So be careful about it. So those are ways that I would say that, you know, are important to think about from, from the standpoint of wealth creation. And then lastly, it's probably the hardest one is, is being an entrepreneur, like starting your own business, right? Yeah. Entrepreneurship is painful, and speaking from personal experience, a very, very low guarantee of, of executing. But if you are able to execute, wow, that can be life changing for the family. Yeah. It could just provide the seed to grow, or it could become the whole orchard that is provided forever, right? You know, Amazon is, is definitely a few orchards. Yeah, yeah, agreed. All right, so is there, and this is something I'm sure someone out there is wondering. So we've been speaking about generational wealth and wealth in general. How does one quantify it? Like, is, is there a number that I work towards? Is it something that, I, how do I know that I've achieved wealth? Yeah. 
And then how do I know that I have enough that will, you know, go to that third and, and fourth generation? But so, so I would say that, again, that's something that's deeply personal. In, in my case, I don't have a number. I have a target that I'd like to get to. And then I, would ex- I want to exceed the target after that. And that's, that's how I feel targets should be. Targets are not things to be achieved. They are things to be exceeded. But come up with a number based on here is what I would like to do with my life over the next X years. So you figure out based on the age, right? I'm 41. For the next 49 years, here's what I want to accomplish. And then there's, there's going to be a price tag to that. It might be a, a kind of a vacation I want to do. It's a certain amount that I want. I have a literal amount that I've discussed at University of Miami, for example, that I would want to, to donate to create an endowment fund that pays for X kinds of scholarship. Right? Here's the amount I want to donate to this other place. So I have numbers that are minimums. In order to achieve this legacy for my family that's going to last 100 years, these are the things I need to do. This is what's going to cost. To have my family feel fairly comfortable, here's the things I need to accomplish from a material standpoint to provide. So this is obviously shelter, house, and then transportation, car, life insurance, the cost, and so on. And then you think about college. You know, so, so those give you numbers. But that's your baseline. That's not your top line. That's your baseline numbers. And then you want to go beyond that. But if you have never stopped to think about what do I want to accomplish, right? How much do I want to give away and to who and what will it look like? What do I want to own or have owned at some point? I might own it and then sell it. There's nothing wrong with that. You don't have to own the yacht for your life or the car for your own life. <laughs> it gives you a starting point, though. And that's the most important. You need a starting point. And it is, is eye-opening, though. When you do those numbers, you're like, Oh, wow, that's actually higher than I thought it was going to be. And now you say, how do I get to this point? And you find people who have gotten there, and then you can work on it. But again, you need to have a pathway, right? And so this now has a North Star, and I have a path. I know where I want, I know where I want to get to. And so that's, that's what I would say from, you know, how do I know how much, you know, how do I quantify wealth? I mean, in some cases, I want to impact X amount of people. It's going to cost X dollars to provide a scholarship to that amount of people. Is this, is this number? And that's just yeah. going to have to, I got to be able to give away $50,000 comfortably. Okay. How are I going to make it? How, how do I get to a point where I can write a check for $50,000 US dollars as a, a charitable contribution and just, and not even bat an eye? In fact, I'm going to be grateful that I was yeah. able to do that. So, yeah. Yeah, it's it, it's similar for me as well. I, I, I noticed that at the point that I, because I didn't think I needed a number, but then when when I started investing seriously, and I started thinking about things like like you know leaving my nine to five early, you know having a certain lifestyle, being being charitable in the way that I would want to, and I started to think about okay, what would it mean? Because we we've, we've thought about scholarships as well for. Lurgo Invest, we want to be able to do a certain amount of, you know, scholarships per year, for for example. When I think about those things, I say, well, for me to be able to do those things and provide for my family and to take care of everything that I need to, I I started to work things out in my head and I'm like, okay, that number now, it changed the way that I invested because now I'm not investing just arbitrarily. I have something I'm working towards. So instead of, you know, investing for the short term, I started thinking more long term because I realized that for for the kind of growth that I'm looking for, I'm not looking for twenty or thirty percent. I'm looking for five hundred percent or one thousand percent. Exactly. So I started investing differently. No, exactly, and I think that you live your life differently once you quantify things that you want to accomplish. And, and we, we instinctively know this, though. When we're children, we know we want to, to be able to buy a certain thing and we, so we're going to save money. It changes our focus. It's completely changed. Like you, you can buy less patty and you buy less sweetie because I want to be able to buy this thing. And you, you save differently. Your spending habits change. So it's the same way when I know this is what I want to accomplish from a wealth standpoint for my life. It changes the way you invest because you say, oh, crap, well, I can't just work nine to five and get to this point. I need to invest. Exactly. In fact, I need to invest more. I might need to be more aggressive or I need to change this thing or I need to add a second stream. But it gets you to properly analyze 
what you've been doing so far and recognize, do I need to change anything? Or you might say, in fact, oh, I am right on target. Yay. Let's just exactly. keep going now, right? So, yeah. or, or in some cases, some people are, are, are overachieving and they say, you know what, let me enter a little bit of that no because you don't know what, you know, a pandemic might come and I'll never get to fly for two years. Let me take the vacation today instead. So. Agreed. Agreed. All right, so this may be a weird question to some, but I'm going to ask it because I think it was something that, you know, when we were talking about mindsets earlier, it, it, it was something that I thought would be, you know, interesting to discuss. Are there any downsides to generational wealth? Yeah, well, I, I think that's a fair question. And that's a reasonable question because all of us have at least read stories of people who have mainly inherited wealth and then gone on to, to die young or have major issues mm -hmm. and not become productive members of society. So yes, there are downsides to generational wealth, but it's actually not the wealth itself that's a downside. The downside was a lack of financial literacy, the lack of knowledge passed on, the lack mm -hmm. of value of money. So, so it's a reflection on, on the parents, ultimately, not a reflection on wealth. Right? People make the same mistakes with or without money. So, so that's that's going to be important. Don't blame it on the wealth. Right? Blame it on the parents. But yes, it, it means they can get into more trouble though. That that's the difference, right? You, they can afford to buy certain kind of hard drugs instead of just you know other drugs, which which it can be way worse for what they end up doing. Uh, so I think that is that is crucial to understand. And but don't blame it on on the inherited wealth itself. Of yeah, course, the other downside though is that if you have wealth and you don't give your children proper exposure to, to, to the middle class and normal people so they understand your privilege, they can end up looking down on people. They might still be good at managing the money, but they don't believe in sharing. They don't want to give back to anybody. Uh, they, they look down on people. They want to vote in a certain way. They only want certain kinds of people in politics, certain kinds of laws that, that hurt everybody else. And then they complain. I don't understand why they just don't do this. You know, it, it's funny you bring that up. There was a a tweet a few weeks ago that uh, was a professor at, at a, a major university in the U.S., an Ivy League university, talking about her, her graduate class. They're all in like the MBA program. And she asked a class, what do you think the average American, what do you think is the average income for a family of four in the United States? And they completely way overshoot, right? They, they, the median income... Is, is somewhere in the 37,000 range in the US, which most people don't realize that. But, but that's, that's where we are. It's way below 50,000. And everybody was thinking it's at least $120,000. Mm -hmm. I know. And it's like, no, you, you're not in the real world, man, right? You can end up having children that are out of touch or grandchildren who are out of touch yeah. because they have inherited wealth. So, you need to be very careful, but that's where that mission, vision, values, that family group works, right? They, you help your family to understand. Here's what we do: turn 13 years old, we expose you to the real world, we take you there, figure out something that you think can work for you. Most of us can't fly the children to Southeast Asia and show them the factory that the family owns, right? You know, we, we need to do something else, but there has to be a way to minimize the effect. Of inherited wealth so they don't look down on their fellow humans and then cause more pain by they have the money to, to write the checks they like the the politicians who write the laws who then inflict more pain on these people so let's let's be cautious and not add to that and let's in, in fact prevent that from happening yeah so so the main thing that i'm taking away that i want persons to remember here is that wealth is not the issue right so when we when we think of downside to wealth what we're seeing is the key thing here is financial literacy being able to pass on those skill sets to the next generation and ensuring that they are they are grounded in terms of being good persons good stewards right. and then they'll be able to handle the wealth properly so when we when I mean, it goes back to the same mindset thing that we were talking about before where, I mean, there are persons who, who we know that they don't want, there's no desire at all to have anything more than what they need to get by because they have this mindset that if they have too much, it's going to change who they are. 
Right. And so, yeah, I, I just wanted persons to just kind of, you know, hold on to that because that's very, very important. Yeah, right. I'll repeat the three things. Mission, vision, values. Yeah. Values is how you're going to solve the issue of generational wealth leading to children who are not grounded or grandchildren. Right? Values is going to be critical. Critical. Yeah. All right. So this is the final question that we'll have for you, David. I'm, I'm going to ask you one more question and then we're going to take some questions and, and just look at some comments from the, from the oh. audience. So what is a very simple way to introduce investing to our children? Play Monopoly. <laughs> I, I, you cannot get me to say anything else. Play Monopoly. Is nobody can tell me they can't play Monopoly. You could even make your own board. Monopoly, everybody can play Monopoly. You could make your own board if you have to from cardboard. The best way to introduce children to invest in is play Monopoly. Okay. All right. And that's and that's something that 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 game is very common in most households. If you don't have it, you can go out and purchase it. It's something that I, I started to play very early. So yeah, you're you're right. Very good, very good. Um start there so david thank you so much we're going to look at what the audience is saying no thank you guys for being here oh, uh, thank you. looking forward to some questions from the audience <laughs> as well yes um all right so i i think chantal was was commenting that one of the things we said answered a very important question for her you know talking about that guaranteeing that the next generation will manage it properly and possibly add to it. So I, th I think we answered that already. Right. Um, we do want to actually talk about the estate planning part quickly, though. When we yes. Close. Okay. Let's let's do that because I think it's important for persons to understand that part because we spoke about us may not maybe not being here to actually one teach the financial literacy and to right. to ensure that things are in place. So what is it, estate planning, and right. how do we get started? So, so in my case, you know, having gone to the family office events, one of the things I kept talking about was having a family financial Bible. Now, we've heard so many stories about people who, who die without a will, and then the children are caught up for two, two and a half years trying to sort out their estate. And certain things don't happen, pieces get handed over to the, the government instead. So, so number one is have a will. Like go and actually draft a will. Make sure your family members, your parents have a will as well. But a will is not enough, right? A family financial Bible, which I started with my parents to, to make one for all of us, is that it could be a digital document, but it lays out all the assets. Here are all the bank accounts that I have, right? Don't hide anything. At that point, you're not hiding it from somebody. Here are the bank accounts. Here's the, you know, here's a bank. Here's a bank account, so you know where it's connected. Here's any insurance policies that you own, the policy number, the name of the firm, the contact person. Here's any private companies that I invested in. So here's a contact person. Here's a lawyer that handled it for me. Here's any entities I own, any LLCs, C-Corps that I have set up. Put all of that in there. Here's all the assets. Here's where the title is. So I know here's a draw. Like my parents have a filing cabinet. If anything, God forbid, something happened to them, I know the filing cabinet to go to. I know where the keys. I know the filing cabinet. Everything is there organized. They have a document that I can immediately open. I have a physical version and I have one I can open. Same thing with my wife. My wife has a document. She can get into it. It has all my passwords to be able to get into my phone, to get into everything. If something happened to me, you are able to get in. The other thing that, that, that we did in particular, my wife is, is a teacher, an art teacher. She's not the investment person. So I made sure to also sit down and then lay out a plan. If something was to happen to me and I'm no longer here, I'm, you know, life insurance policy kicks in, you have some assets, here is how you should go and invest it. Here's how you should go. Here's who you should talk to, and here's what you should do to go out and invest. Because she's not studying Warren Buffett. She's not studying the, work, the, the role model. So yeah. I think that's another piece to think through. Like after you are gone, leave a plan. The, the, the children might not choose to follow it or your spouse, but at least leave a plan. You're going to be dead, so you probably don't know if they follow it. But leave a plan that says, here's what I would recommend that you do. I mean, you can actually put in a trust and then force them to do it. That's another option as well. But leave a plan in place for them to attempt to follow, and and they should at least consider that as well. So a family financial bible that lays out all the assets, all the accounts, everything that's in one place, 
And then you want to leave ideally some written instruction that can help them to think through how to invest the money that is going to come in in one shot. I mean, this capital shows up and is money that most people would never have had at one time. And so we don't have experience managing that kind of capital. I don't care how well that you've been taught, it's still new to you. Yeah. And you want to at least give them some sort of, you know, instructions. If you want to go one step further, you could actually, you know, do a hypothetical example. It's all right, this amount of money just come, go and spend the next 30 days thinking through how you would deploy it and then come back to me. And then we can work through it and learn from that as well. You know, so it, it, it is a little, for some people it's weird because we're talking about death and so on, which we, as we get older, though, we get more comfortable because we, we just, it's around us, we recognize it's a part of life. But yes, I think that is crucial. And then understanding how tax laws will impact what. So do you gift shares to the children in the company that they own right now? You do it every year. Do you pay the children before they're 18 because they pay their, the child tax version versus later on? Is it that they can claim them versus learn from that quickly? Speak to an expert and then leverage it. It's not, it's not wrong to, to use those things, right? That $15,000 gift tax max that I talked about per year here. There's nothing wrong with doing it. People max that out. If you are not doing it, that's on you. It exists, is legal, follow the rules and execute. Yeah. Exactly. Take advantage of what exists right now. Is it better to set up the trust in a different country or a different state? Well, well, do it. I mean, you can complain that rich people do so and so, but it's legal. So yeah. as long as it's legal, I think that we should be executed. You can try and change the law too, but take advantage of what exists for you because ultimately that is going to affect your family and what your generations will be able to do to help other people. Right? The more capital your family has, the more assets, is the more it can do for others. And there's an assumption, obviously, an inherent assumption that we all want to do more for others as well. So that's not a bad thing, in my opinion, to have more assets that allows you to do more for others. Yeah. So one, one of the things I'm doing that I'll share here is that I'm journaling the process for myself. So everything that, you know, I'm, I'm struggling with, things that I go through, the things that I'm processing in terms of money, I'm writing those things on my investment strategy, my future plans. And, you know, the, the reason why I'm writing that down is that one of the things that I would have loved to be able to do is understand how my father dealt with a lot of the day-to-day -day stuff. Because sometimes we see our parents and we don't really get a chance to hear from them, okay, when you were my age, what did you do? Like, how did you handle this? How, how did you, you know, deal with your first million or your first five million, et cetera? So... Or you manage to buy a house at that age, right? Exactly. So those things, I think, will help him to understand me because I'm, I'm writing it for myself, but I'm intending to pass it on. Pass it on. He can see just what I went through mentally because sometimes, I mean, sure, he can watch the videos that, that we're doing here, right. but, but those, 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 that journal helps him to know me more than anybody else would know me. So right, I, right. I, I, hope, I, I hope we make you know the mistakes and the lessons learned as well, right? We learn even yes. more from that. I remember yeah. when I was in the hospital three years ago, you know, my dad asked me to, but I kept saying, it's unfair that this is happening to me at this age. I'm nice to everybody. I donate money, all these things, right? And he said, well, first of all, it's not about fear or unfair. Life doesn't care about that. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, I need you to spend tonight writing down all the mistakes you can remember that you've made since you were 15. And find a way to only blame yourself. So we can talk about the lessons after that. And so we spent like a good five hours the next day going through the list of these mistakes and how instead of somebody else, what made me do it? And then what was the lesson yeah. from it? And I think that introspection allows us to stop being victims. Yeah. Exactly. Like person taking personal responsibility can be very hard enough, you know, but you there you always play a role. It might play a tiny role. But you still made a decision. Something happened that made you to put yourself in this place or make that investment or you expect it to go a certain way. Why? Right? And so it allows you to recognize that next time and catch it and say, oh, you know what? Let me think twice or let me ask this other question that I didn't ask last time. So I can yeah. get 
doesn't mean don't do it, but it means that you're now smarter. And then you want to pass that on to the next generation. So, right, so they can make new mistakes, not repeat your mistakes. Yes, exactly, exactly. There's this thing that we have about not wanting to share our mistakes because we oh. don't want to... Yeah, well. One, we don't want to be vulnerable, and two, we think that our mistakes will be used against us. And yes. especially with parents and children, where the children are going through a similar path, and instead of bridging the gap by saying, "Hey, I made that mistake too. This is this is what I went through. This is what I think you should do," it actually causes them to separate and not to 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 draw closer. Yeah, well. so, I can't wait to be comfortable enough to share as many of my financial mistakes as possible, and, and then the lessons so that other people can avoid them, right? I've made a ton of mistakes. I've done Same. some right. Like, I can't wait. That, I think, is when people are really going to look at me very different and say, man, I can't believe him talk about that. I can't believe he made that mistake as well. Oh, wow. I guess I'm, you know, I don't feel so bad anymore. But the same way, I was playing golf today with a, a Noah friend of mine. It was the first time I met in person, working together. I'm a client of hers. And, you know, I made some mistakes. Obviously, it's golf. You're always, we're all going to be making mistakes. She's been playing twice as long as me. I hit this amazing driver, and then she goes up the driver and, and land in the bunker. And she just say, yeah, but and the, the other person we're playing with is the wife of the club champion. This guy's won like three years in a row at this, and it's a PGA level. It's where they play the rider mm -hmm. comes from. Proper level thing. And the lady just says, that just reminds us that we're human. We're all human, David. That was a reminder that we're human. Yep, there you that's go. Wow, it's so true. That's actually why I love that sport. It's a constant reminder. One minute you hit this amazing shot, and then you go up to the next hole, you do the same exact thing, and it's gone off in the bush. And it's like, what just reminds yeah. us that we're all human? And we need that. We need that humility. Because sometimes things go really right. And this is, and this is, this is, I would say for me, this is one of the most important things I want to say tonight to everybody watching is that getting things right two or three times doesn't mean that you know what you're doing. It could be that you're lucky. So if you end up developing this, this level of hubris where you think you can do no wrong, that's when you have the downfall. So that means you have the mistake early because then you recognize the mistakes and then you go from there. I've, I've known people who've done really well. I mean, made millions, multi-millions, and then years later, because they thought they had it down pat and they don't need to listen to anybody and I can just follow this plan, which is only their plan, not some role model the recipe, and then they falter and lose most of it. And they go back, get to the drawing board, evaluate what they did wrong, get a recipe from a role model, and then they've gotten back to where and then even exceeded that. Yeah. I, I don't want to lose millions of dollars. I'll be very honest. I think most of us don't ever want to do that. So let's lose a whole lot less. Make the mistakes yeah. early. I agree. Learn to be as humble as possible. Even when you know well and it's right, still remain humble. Okay. All right. So Andrew is asking, you know, how, what, I, I think he's asking, how do you teach your children to set goals? And how, how would that work for children? Ooh, that's all like more parenting advice than, than investment and generational wealth creation advice. Certainly, in my case, you know, for I don't know what age of children, but I think all children at some point you can they could it could be creeping. You want the child to creep to a certain place, so that you're setting a goal for the child, right? You go and you creep. Yeah. Them. I think you show. In, in a lot of cases, children understand more from show and tell right do as i do not as i say they may have a hard time understanding so i think you have to show them it might be that i want them to draw something so i go and draw it first and then they follow and draw but we know children literally follow especially visual what they see is what they end up doing so don't focus on trying to tell them everything go and actually do it with them and then from a goal standpoint i think it, it's tied to rewards like just children Sometimes we feel like we're bribing them, but that's that's not what it is. Like we we, we work and we get a bonus. Like that's a reward, but that was a bribe. I said, hey, you know, if you exceed your targets, you get a bonus. They're bribing us. Well, yeah, that's not a bad thing. So there's nothing wrong with saying here is here is a target. Let's let's aim for something. If you do well, this is the result. And it doesn't have to be a monetary game. It might be yeah. you get extra time to play video games or you get extra time to watch a movie. Something they value. 
is given as a bonus or more of it. And I don't want to say that you, you take it away and then they only get it if they hit the target. I think set the goal and they get more of something they like, not more yeah. of what you necessarily like. You might not want them, right? I, I'll give you an example. I remember with mom, so I, was, I was in college, right? 15, I started university. Mom was complaining that I play, I play in video games. I said, all right, here's the deal, mom. This semester, I get to play all the video games I want to play anytime I want. I grew up in a house where we had set times to go and so we had a literal study. We had a, we had a whole study system set up on certain days. I'm going to X amount for biology and math. And so that's how I grew up and then asked permission to play games and we have a time limit and so on. So now college come and I feel like I'm a little bit older. And I said, well, let me play as much as I want to play but I have to get all A's. And if I don't get A's, then next semester we can adjust what we do. And next semester I got all A's. And mom just said, all right, that's it, I'm done. Like, all that matters to me was that I got A's. So clearly, you know how to manage this thing. But they gave me the chance to experiment, right? They yeah. don't care about video games. They thought games are more of a negative thing. I think more of us today, if we, have, we grew up with video games, so we look at them a bit differently. Especially kids making money from video games. But games help with hand-eye coordination. You can learn things. They help with problem solving. I play games with my kids. You know, Zelda in particular and so on. So, but that was it. Allow the children to come up with a prize. And then you set the goal. And then, they, and then that gives them that extra motivation. I think that works best. You set the goal. They choose the prize. And, and you just go from there. As long as it's not something crazy price based on their age, obviously. Yeah, agreed. All right, so Kefash is asking, is there a way to have the, the, the family Bible that you mentioned stored digitally with the same legal validity? So, so I want to point out, it, it's not a legally valid document, right? A will is something that's legal. The family financial Bible is literally just an internal document. It's like a company wrote an internal memo. So, so you don't have to worry about legal valid, validity. In our case, we have, it, we, have it in Google, we have it in a Google Drive. Between my wife and I, like that's that's where it is in a Google Drive. You know, Dad has it stored in the cloud as well, right? Dropbox or something. So you don't have to worry about the legal validity. You will never show up and go to a lawyer and say, "Here's what this stuff is." It's for you to be able to understand. Here's yeah. where the assets are. The will is ultimately what matters. But I need to be able to quickly know where I need to go and where stuff is versus, oh, I have no idea what assets the family have. I have no idea what is a life insurance policy. I have to go dig up. And figure out where's the paperwork and which, you know, in, in, in most cases, the, the generations before us have it literally in a filing cabinet in a manila envelope and we, we want to look at the label. So make make life simpler for the people who have to deal with your estate. Yeah. Create a digital document and just break it out. It's just that simple. But don't yeah. worry about legal validity for it. It's not a legal document. It's internal process-related document. Okay. Terian is saying that she's very thankful for, for this, this session and you know she's she's more motivated to learn and to do more and she's seeing where it's possible to achieve generational wealth. So we're glad that we could be you know providing value there for you, Terian. And you should definitely check out the other video that we did with David, that, mm -hmm. that masterclass on building wealth. You should watch that video as well. I'm not seeing any more questions. Guys, you want to take advantage of David being here? Ask any question. It doesn't matter. I see Jason here asking what, what kind of returns Luke has been getting on, on Roblox on his shares. Oh, geez. You know what? I demand giving me a login. I'm pulling up right now. That's what you want me to do because I, I haven't checked recently. So yeah. they, 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 don't just, they don't just own Roblox, by the way. So. Okay. Karen is saying she's she's ordering Monopoly on Amazon right now. She, she's not <laughs> it, so. I love it. I love it. All right. So, boy, I hope Luke don't come to me later, years later, and I said, "Boy, Daddy, you got bust my portfolio." Exactly. And the thing, you know, and obviously, man, January was a really bad month, right? So, so I'm view investments. I he is down thirty four percent on Roblox right now. Uh, he's up 43% on Microsoft. And I'll, I'll give you some of the ideas of how, how he built this portfolio as well. <laughs> so, so they get to pick their portfolio and then and, and I help them a little bit with mix. But it's really for them to experiment with. This yeah. is, is a smaller money. 
And so, you know, Luke said he wanted Microsoft. I said, why? He's like, oh, well, we all use these computers at school and they have this thing called Microsoft Windows on it. And you have a Microsoft Xbox. I see Microsoft everywhere. So I think if our school has it, there are a bunch of other schools that have this Microsoft Windows thing too. And, and a lot of you play Xbox. So I think Microsoft should be a good company to own. Okay. Makes sense. He has Netflix, which, which is down 27%. This is all since he bought it. This is not like this yeah. morning. So Netflix is down. And, you know, Netflix for him, he bought Netflix because we subscribe to Netflix. We watch a ton of stuff. He mainly watches Pokemon now on Netflix. Well, well you know, that, that, that's such a simple portfolio. Those are things that he uses every day. That's exactly how he came up. I mean, I so I'll go through. So Netflix, we use Netflix every day. We pay money. We might as well. He hear me saying that if you... If you spend money all the time, you might as well get paid to own it. So you should get dividends. Yep. So Netflix, he uses it because other people use it. They charge a monthly fee and they can raise the fee because he sees the fee go up. So he has Netflix that's down. He has Apple in his portfolio. Actually, the same way as Microsoft or Netflix. He's up 43% on his Apple. Nice. And he bought Apple because mommy and daddy have iPhones. Uncle Robert has an iPhone. We have Mac computers all over the house. Clearly, Apple is... Is really doing well. In his opinion, people are buying Apple, so he bought Apple. Yeah. We live by Disney. Uh, we live ten minutes from Disney World. We see fireworks every night at eight fifteen. And Disney yeah. Plus growing in so in there. Plus, he bought. So he has Disney in his portfolio. He's up twelve percent on Disney, and he bought Disney because we, we got there all the time. We have Disney Plus. They bought Star Wars. His name is Luke. Yes, Luke Skywalker. They bought Star Wars and they bought Marvel. And so he said, "Well, Daddy, they're going to have even more content than they can put out, and even more movies to put out." So he wanted Disney. And then he has Amazon in there, and he's, he's down 2% on Amazon. Again, he sees all these Amazon boxes at everybody's house in the neighborhood when they're driving home from school. That's why he wanted Amazon. And then lastly, we have a gamer's portfolio in Stash. Mm -hmm. they have a, it's called Gamers for the Win. So it's a gamer's ETF. So he just bought a, a general ETF. Instead of buying NVIDIA and Activision, all those guys, he just bought a, an ETF that covered esports and and. Mm -hmm. So, so that's how we came to this portfolio. I like that portfolio. It, it's good at his, his age. And those are brands that we all expect to be here 20, 30 years from now as well. So that's exactly, good. Exactly. Exactly. So, but as you can imagine, I have a lot of fun sitting with the boys for them to create their, their portfolio. And here's their reasoning. Yeah. So, yeah. Do it with your kids. You, you'll have fun. Even if it's a hypothetical portfolio, it's not real. Have them sit down and start going through, and you're gonna be surprised. It's gonna be a fun exercise to do, and then even just to track it, they build it online, you track it. It's not real money, but you track it over time, and they get on, they get to understand this stuff goes up and down. It is not perfect and up and to the right, and get them into that sense of hey, this is going to be a bit of a way, but over time is up and to the right. Agreed. So Andrew is asking, what, what do you think of cryptocurrency and have you taught your kids about it? So, so no, I haven't taught my kids about crypto and I, I'll eventually talk to them about it. But for me, again, alternative assets. So you choose your role model, their recipe, don't change recipe. I have my role models. They did not need to invest in, in any sort of cryptocurrencies to create their wealth. So yeah, I come from the school of thought where I want to understand the business that I'm going to own, and then I would like to get paid to own that business. That's that's nice. The dividend would be nice. And so if I don't understand the business, I am not necessarily going to invest, right? And I'd separate investing from speculating. Crypto is an alternative asset. In my case, I would rather buy the companies that power that, right? Investing in the blockchain companies, great. Mm -hmm. I think that that's not going anywhere. I think blockchain does actually solve problems. And also the exchanges, right? Right. I mean, for me, I, I think of investing in cryptocurrencies is the same as investing in forex, right? It, it, that to me, that that's a, that's some that's more on the speculative side. There is wealth to be created there. Find a role model who has a recipe for creating wealth with those things, and then move forward, right? To each their own. There is no right or wrong way to deploy. It's again risk tolerance and what you feel makes sense. So. I agree. Buy the role model if you're interested in that. There's there's no question about you know there's there's clearly opportunity and, and money to be made even in NFTs. There are new things that are coming. Be open to it, look at it, find your role model, and then stick though. Don't have anybody come and say, Oh, you're an idiot because you're not doing this. No, well, I might not yeah. invest in real estate. So what? That's it doesn't mean I'm stupid. It means I have a recipe that I am following because it fits my risk tolerance and my 
plan. And I think we need to constantly remind ourselves that what works for one person doesn't work for me. The same stock basket doesn't necessarily work for me. The same approach and investments don't work. Everybody has a slightly different portfolio. And that's why you're going to have that initial chat with a financial advisor, for example. Or yeah. Yeah, agreed. And I think that's a very important point because I see this sometimes on social media where persons like to compare the different types of investments and yeah. the different types of investors and even the investment strategy. And I'm like, if if what they're doing is working, especially for them, who are you to be critical of it? If you don't like it, if it's not for you, that's okay. Okay, but I mean, yeah, this, 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 you know, kind of, I mean, <laughs> I mean, I mean, what, what, what we see, other, I mean, we know some people who are entrepreneurs who say, "Man, why you want to work a nine to five? Why would they bother that?" Wait, Perfect maybe, example as well. Yeah, maybe I prefer stability and the career yeah. is a well, single investing. <laughs> is each is individual. That's yeah. the, investing is personal in finance. Yeah. Yeah. Right. So, I mean, I always say if, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, somebody has to work for you. So if, if, if yeah. your, your own business is still somebody else's nine to five, if you're going to hire people. Yeah. So you can't look down at nine to five. Then. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. Right. All right. Uh, Ma well, I'm, I'm assuming this is not his name, but Matic is saying, mm -hmm. what exactly do you look for in a company before purchasing shares? So uh, I love this one. So I, I get to repeat the, the lessons from, from Michael Leachin, right? Mike has five principles of wealth creation. So, so number one, you want to own a few high quality businesses, domicile in strong long-term growth industries run by capable management, uh, prudent managers of capital, and then hold for the long term. So few uh, needs to be domiciled in a strong long-term growth industry. That's critical. And then I want to look at management, right? When you buy into a company, you buy management, critical, and preferable management with skin in the game. And then obviously I want to be looking at people who are prudent managers of capital. So and whether that is debt capital, right? Or the capital that comes in from investors, equity capital, the profits, that's capital coming into the business as other people's money, and right? All of those are other people's money. And we want them to be prudent managers of that of that capital and then i would want to be looking for something i can hold for the long term i'm not here trying to buy and hold for the next six months or the next year i want to think five years from now is this a business that i think i still want to own i, I am not here to go and keep changing changing the stocks every every week every month i'm not a trader i want to be an investor i pay attention to the portfolio something might happen and you want to determine is it a short-term problem or is it a long-term problem but again that's where management comes in so, so that's the core that that we would look at and then we, we broaden that beyond that eventually and we can go a bit deeper in terms of the management style you know how are they running it how much skin in the game does management have you know mike likes to joke that you know it, when you have completely external management who has no skin in the game is pretty much heads they win tails you lose in the sense of they do a really good job, they get a great bonus. They do an okay job and meet the numbers. They get a smaller bonus. If they do a horrible job, they get a golden parachute. Yeah. That's, not, that's not what we want to be seeing with management. We need to, we need to have alignment of incentives. So that's what we're looking for before we buy shares in a company. The company could be great. We still care about the people and the management and how they think about strategy beyond that. So we, we want to talk to them management yeah agreed all right so guys we actually covered this in depth in the next video oh, yeah. that they joined us for so i'll place the link in the description i'll ask my co-founder who's in the chat renee can you share the link to that video as well so persons can see no but we'll update the description with the link to that video all right so i'm looking i'm not seeing any more questions so david i'll ask you for just your final thoughts as we close out this session so I, I was expecting a question that would come up about spouse, right? If you are the one that's big on generational wealth, how do you get your spouse 
they end up sharing Land question. Yeah. Mindset, right? Because yeah. if you want the next generation to continue, it, it can't just be one person, right? If it's, that's it's true. Important. And so that that's the one I want to leave on. And so, you know, going into now 15 years of marriage, for me, it was having her read as many of the things that I read, sharing some of those same books, share, share the same articles. So she's reading literally Warren Buffett's book right then. She's reading these books that I'm reading. She's reading these stories and then we discuss them so that she can understand what I'm talking about. She doesn't need to have an MBA like I do, but at least we read some of the same things and then I can share what I've learned and explain if there's a question that she might not understand. But I would say that's the thing. It's typical that you don't necessarily do it at the same time. One person may learn a little faster. Don't leave them behind. Don't talk down to them in the volume and say, you know, this book was really interesting. You should check this one out. Yeah. The, the Warren Buffett one, the snowball effect is very thick. But what we did was that we did the audiobook version. And ah, so there you go. we would do these cross country trips to our sister in California. And we would play the audio version of the Warren Buffett book. We play the audio version of the Steve Jobs book. And, and so we get to listen at the same time and then pause, talk about what they just talked about in the chapter or even some of the decisions that they made, right? You, you, in that case, those books, especially when it's more biographical as well, you get to learn about the family dynamics that have developed yeah. and issues that may even come. And so we talk about that and go from there. And then also make sure you understand the spouse's mission, vision, values, right? You want to merge. It's not to be an, an autocrat and a dictator. So are they comfortable with what are their things? You might have more mindset to change on their side than yours. And so how do you do that? You don't want to beat them over the head, make them feel bad and force it. You want to take some time. If they feel uncomfortable around wealth, how do you get them feeling more comfortable? Is it that you go to the, the Porsche dealership or the Ferrari dealership and sit in the car and just feel the leather, right? And like, oh, this car isn't evil. People who drive it aren't evil. <laughs> you never know. But, you know, you did not. You may connect with somebody who is who is wealthy, might be a mentor, have them meet the person, get to talk to them on the phone or uh, get to meet them in some way. It might be a video call or an in-person dinner so they can get more comfortable with Oh, even though that person is rich, they're nice. That's the kind of person I want to be, right? Yeah. So I think spend more time ensuring that you have the support of your spouse because you cannot raise your children with with only one of you wanting to do it one way. Another yes. person say no. Yes. Like that's a recipe for disaster, especially generational wealth. So care about the person you marry. It matters. Talk to them before they get married to understand their opinion on money. Right, and it's, it's not a, a deal. Some things will be a deal breaker, let's be very honest. But in most cases, it just allows you to understand what work you will have to put in, what work they will have to put in. And yeah. then try to be, I mean, I'll be honest, I feel like that sometimes, right? I'm, I'm the guy that can be the professor and feel like you should have gotten this answer quicker. <laughs> so, so you have to tone it down. I didn't get this one that fast. Let's take some time. And then after that, make sure you, you do like a quarterly family meeting. You would do it in a business, do it within a family, say, here's, yeah. here's our goals, here's where we are now. And so they feel like a part of it because somebody takes the lead. It's not both. Of somebody might be better at numbers than another person. Somebody's better at organizing. Let them play a part in it and feel uh, like it. Yeah. And like a part of it, yeah. Yeah, so um, at... at that's perfect. I, th I think a great way to end. Um, it definitely seems like a topic that my co-founder and I, well, my wife and I should cover as well. We do have a channel for couples where we speak about finance and relationships and stuff. We haven't done that. We, we haven't really covered the topic on how to manage finances as a couple on this channel. So maybe that's something we'll do. I thought about whether or not our, our community would be for it or not. So you guys can tell us if you're interested in that content, leave it in the in the comments and let us know. David, I want to thank you so much. Really do appreciate it. This was a great session. I, I'm definitely gonna watch it myself afterwards, take notes because there are some things that I definitely want to remember from it. Guys, if there are any questions that we missed, feel free to post it in the comments and I'll share it with David and he'll just take his time and go through. David will respond to every single comment that you place under the video. So feel free to ask any questions that are there. Thank you so much, David. Really greatly appreciate it. 
And so we'll definitely be speaking again soon. There, there are some other topics that I have in mind that I'm, I'm giving you time. I'm, I'm spacing them out. <laughs> I appreciate that. But no, thank you for everything that you do and for the learn growth in this community. It is so important to recognize that thanks to technology, we can do this. Our parents, our grandparents yeah. did not have this opportunity. So we need to take advantage of it. So thank you guys for participating and for sharing for the questions, for the comments, and keep getting smarter. Thank you. Agreed. All right, David, uh, take care. All right, guys, so I have some announcements that I wanted to make before we end this video. So we do have our upcoming investment class next Saturday. If you want to register for that, the link is in the description. Uh, I mentioned that channel about you know, couples and relationships and marriage. If you're interested, my wife just placed the link in the chat. That's loving to the max. That's loving to the M-A-C-K-S. You can check that out. We share our story, you know, how the Lord took us from debt to, you know, mastering our finances, how we were able to overcome, you know, marital challenges, etc. So please do check out that channel. Um, also, we... Let me see if there is any other announcement. Please join us on Telegram. We have a growing community, a very active community, and that's our best place to support you. We have groups on all platforms, but Telegram is the one that we're able to give you the kind of support that as a new investor, you may find valuable. For the other community groups, feel free to join them because at some point we're going to ramp up activities for those as well. I'm sorry again if there are any other questions that I missed. Please post them in the comments below the video and I'll go through and David and I will answer them. So, you know, one of the things I actually missed that I'll do now at the start was we actually, since we are a Bible-based investment community, actually we just want to kind of pray over this session, you know, because this is a very important topic and something that I pray that you will be able to pass on to your children. So... You know, Lord, we just thank you that we're able to have this session. Lord, thank you for David and the wisdom that he imparted to us. Lord, I pray for everyone watching that you will give them wisdom, understanding, and knowledge to be able to teach their children how to, to invest and be and be wealth and be good stewards of wealth. So, Lord, we thank you for this community. We just thank you for everything in Jesus' name. Amen. So, guys, thank you so much. Great session. And we will see you in the next video.